Dr. K Hamish Carver is our next speaker. Dr. Carver did his PhD research on the paramedic preceptor and their role and how to operationalise it, and he's here to share some of that lessons learned with you. Um, if you could welcome Dr. Hamish Carver. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Hamish Carver. I'm currently an ICP at Ryde in Sydney's North. I've been with New South Wales Ambulance since 2001 and my interest in this topic started from my very first roster as a vocational level one in Sydney's West. A lot has changed over the years but the importance of preceptorship as a critical link in the formative development and support of new employees has and will always remain fundamental to developing safe and professional practitioners into the future. So today I wanted to start and share with you a few key findings of my PhD research and then give you some ideas on how to get the most out of the paramedic preceptor role. Many of you will already do these things and that's great. You should feel encouraged you're on the right track. But hopefully today will also provide some practical ideas for you to take away with you. So what is preceptorship? Well, it's a model of clinical education which pairs a novice or beginner clinician with a more experienced one in a formal educational partnership for a time limited period in the practice setting. In New South Wales Ambulance, this novice may be an undergraduate student on clinical placement, maybe a P1T in their internship year or a vocational level one. It can even be ECP or an ICP in their on-road practicum training. Over the years, New South Wales Ambulance has called this role many things, training officer, clinical mentor and more recently preceptor. But I think preceptor is the most appropriate because what we do is more than just training and mentoring is fundamentally more focused on the personal development outside the practice setting. So when you are working with a P1T, you have a student, or working with a level one, you are undertaking this important role of paramedic preceptor. And we know from the research that the transition to clinical practice from the education environment, be that Roselle AEC or a university, can be a difficult and challenging time for new clinicians. We've all been there, and many of you may remember some of these feelings. Placements and ride-alongs just weren't long enough to adequately prepare you for the realities of ambulance. Feeling stressed, anxious, and sometimes just completely out of your depth, or even feeling like a fraud. Cognitive dissonance when your expectations and mental preparation for the role of being a paramedic conflicted with the realities of the job feeling overwhelmed, that you don't fit in, that you're an outsider, all of which can impact on the quality of your learning and affect your confidence and emotional well-being. And a disconnect between what you thought you knew and the divide between knowledge and performance out on the road. Now these challenges are not unique to paramedicine and these findings align across the health professions, which is why I think the pedagogy Preceptorship pedagogy remains so important and fundamental to early career development. So in 2016, I completed my PhD on paramedic preceptorship, in which I interviewed a number of qualified paramedics from a whole range of areas. I explored their experience of being in the paramedic preceptor role, the emotional aspects of it, and to determine how well paramedics felt prepared and supported to undertake this special role. So I thought I would share just a few of the findings with you, which I'm sure will be no surprise to most of you. As paramedics, we usually work with a partner, notwithstanding the on-call single call-outs and some single responder roles, 
but usually we settle into the shift with one paramedic predominantly acting as the treating officer and the other driving. With this, we divide up the responsibilities of the day. We know who does what. But when you work with a novice clinician, suddenly this dichotomous role gets blurred. And as the preceptor, you have responsibility for everything, everything getting done correctly and in a timely way. While the novice assesses the patient, so too must you. If your partner is an experienced paramedic, you can just ask them to go to the car and get some equipment, give a missed report, etc., without the finer details. But the novice will require more help and guidance. For example, if I asked an experienced paramedic for a spine board, they will know to bring back the straps, the sandbags, and also be considering extrication along the way. But for the new novice, they may just come back to you with the board. This is just part of the learning process. In another example, when you're loaded and driving to the hospital, not only are you concentrating on the road as the driver, hoping that Rue doesn't decide to cross paddocks right in front of you as you go past, but you also have to be listening to the patient and novice interaction in the back, ensuring that the right questions are being asked, that medications are being given correctly, and that patient deterioration is not being overlooked. So at the end of the day, you can feel like you've worked two jobs, and this can have a negative effect on your experience as preceptors. And it can be stressful. There is often a palpable sense of responsibility sitting on your shoulders, and this can weigh heavily on you. You are responsible for not only good patient care, but all the activities that come with paramedicine, and on top of this, for the quality of learning and well-being of another paramedic. And this can be hard work. In many areas of the state, paramedics have said to me that as preceptors, we are rostered to work with trainees and P1Ts, roster after roster after roster. It is important that we recognise this can lead to preceptor fatigue and potentially affect the quality of the preceptor experience for both the novice and the experienced paramedic. Which means it can be exhausting. I've been there, as many of you have too. Your mind is always on. You are always thinking about everything that has happened, is happening and needs to happen. And so to recognise that being a preceptor is an additional workload you have to bear. And this can take a physical and emotional toll. And this needs to be recognised. But it's not all negative. We know that working as a paramedic preceptor is not always easy. You play an important role which often goes under-recognised. But remember these positives. The experience can be rewarding. Seeing the novice clinician grow in competence and confidence, watching them become professional practitioners, largely because of your input, your support and your knowledge. Some find this process motivating as you learn together. And preceptorship can foster friendships that go long on after the preceptorship finishes. Aside from the personal aspects of the, this role, one of the other key findings to emerge from my study was that many paramedics do not fully understand what the preceptor is supposed to be doing whilst acting in this role. Terms such as training officer are banded around, but what does this actually mean? So to give you some structure in how to precept, I would like to go through what I see as the four key roles and responsibilities of the paramedic preceptor and some ideas on how to operationalise this role. This simple model breaks down these roles and responsibilities into these dimensions of coach, role model, socialiser and protector. I use the term coach because I feel it best describes the teaching and learning relationship between preceptor and novice. You are not there simply to convey knowledge or train someone in isolated tasks but to help the learner translate knowledge into practice, woven into the complexities of the real world. Coaching describes how you guide, support and facilitate learning in the practice setting, giving space for a novice to develop their performance. So if we're not just giving them information, but developing practice and knowledge in action, 
How do you go about this coaching? Understand your learner. Every learner comes with their own life experience. Adults, even young adults, come with their own unique knowing of the world and perspective. Each has their own strengths, weaknesses, extensive knowledge in some areas and gaps in others. To be effective, you need to understand your learner and their individual needs. Play to their strengths, their preferred learning styles and their personal motivations. Creating a trusting relationship of mutual respect. Trust and rapport builds a relationship of openness and confidence for the novice to extend themselves to be open to criticism, feedback and advice. Focus on application and knowledge in action. Preceptorship, after all, develops practice. So align learning points and feedback to performance and knowing how to do something rather than framing information just on knowing what to do. It's a subtle difference, but it does make a difference. Learning, learning in preceptorship is a two-way street. You will learn from them as they will learn from you. This is one of the benefits of precepting. You have a growth mindset into your own performance as a preceptor and be the student. Being a good preceptor takes effort and time and it is a learned skill set. Reflection is fundamental to professional practice. As professional practitioners, we must learn to be self-critical, reflexive in our practice and to be lifelong learners. Instilling this quality early in your learner as a lifelong learner sets them on the right path now. There are lessons to be learned in every case we do, regardless of how many years or decades that we've been in the job. And when undertaking the reflective process, don't just ask, what did you do well? Explore why it went well and break it down. And remember, if this reflective process is to be effective, preceptees and preceptors alike must be prepared to be open and honest. Only if the relationship is built on mutual trust and support will this process be truly effective. Step in, step out is a process whereby you give the novice space and opportunity for progressive independence. Step out of their way. Give them room to take risk and lead the way. But always be ready to step in and protect patient safety and support the novice on their learning journey. And visual literacy is about learning how what the eyes see influences practice. Examples of this include everything from the pallor of a patient's skin, the diaphoresis in a chest pain patient, assessing work of breathing simply by seeing the movements of the body and chest. The experienced paramedic doesn't need a pulse ox to tell you the patient's hypoxic. You recognise this from what you see. And then there are the material aspects such as planning extrication as you walk into a scene, judging step heights, how many steps, the geometry of corners, whether the stretcher will fit down a hallway or in a lift. You see these things instinctually, but as preceptor, you need to teach this awareness to your novice. Learning to be a paramedic is much more than clinical practice. Your coaching brings together the soft skills, logistics, staying safe, and becoming of an expert practicing clinician. And give, giving good feedback is also critical to learning and coaching. So my top tips for feedback are be specific. Why and how something was done well is much more valuable than simply saying, job well done. Be balanced. Be complimentary to reinforce the positives as well as offering feedback for improvements. Good feedback is actionable. The novice should be able to take the feedback you've given them and use it in the real world. And by this, I mean that good feedback feeds forward. Positive feedback helps correct, reinforce correct behaviour and actions to continue, and constructive criticism identifies gaps. But both must incorporate advice 
to make positive change to improve future practice. The second dimension of preceptorship is being a role model, which is fairly self-explanatory. Suffice to say, just remember that role modelling is everything that you do. How you wear your uniform, how you speak and interact with other paramedics, other agency personnel, nursing staff, and not least, patients and their families. New employees want to fit in, they want to belong. And a significant way that humans do this is by learning what is accepted by imitating group dynamics. Everything that you do, say, and how you carry yourself in interactions with others teaches the novice about the way things are, the language that is used, and demonstrates the expectation. We subconsciously act out these cultural norms every day without knowing it. But when you have a novice, you need to be more aware that what they learn is the acceptable way to conduct themselves is often from the way you do things. Now, by socialiser, I don't mean social media manager or organising barbecues. I'm talking about professional socialisation into the role of paramedic. Professional socialisation is a process where individuals acquire the specialised knowledge, skills, attitudes, values, norms, and learn the unwritten rules of an organisation and the profession more broad broadly. It's how we develop our professional identity as paramedics. These intangible cultural aspects of the role can only be learned while immersed in the practice environment and not taught from a policy or book. Your role as preceptor is to help the novice navigate these cultural norms and learn the unwritten rules. Help them understand where they fit into the organisation. Introduce them to key players such as managers, CTOs and other colleagues. Don't underestimate the importance of some material aspects such as providing lockers, pigeonholes. This makes a person feel part of the team and it gives them a sense of belongingness. Bring them into the fold of your station and New South Wales Ambulance as a whole. And remember that role modelling is also an important point here. If you project an attitude that your novice is an equal member of the team, others will accept them in that way too. And the fourth dimension I want to discuss is that of preceptor as protector, both as a guardian of patient safety and as a guardian of novice wellbeing. Preceptorship is foremost a learning environment. We've spoke of letting novices learn by doing, to be challenged to take the lead, make decisions and become independent practitioners. But in doing so, from time to time, they will falter, they will get stuck, they will be wrong and they will make mistakes. And this is okay. This is a normal part of the learning and development process. This is learning in the real world. But an important role as preceptor is to step in before patient safety is compromised, thereby protecting the patient. The challenge is to learn to do this in a subtle way, using graded assertiveness that achieves this goal, but does not undermine, belittle, or discourage them from learning. Be suggestive, give pause for consideration of an alternative treatment. Consider your tone and body language as you do this. Collaborate, don't overtake wherever possible. This is why it is important that you know your learner and provide preceptorship that is individualised to each novice. You are the safety net for the patient. Like all safety nets, not always needed, but always there. In addition to protecting patient safety, preceptors also have a crucial role in protecting the novice. Yes, this is an adult learning environment, but our practice setting is complex, unpredictable, and filled with potential hazards. And the three areas that I see where the preceptor protects the novice include physical safety, emotional safety and well-being, and protecting confidence and self-esteem. Physical safety is quite wide in scope. It encompasses everything from the fundamentals of PPE, 
How many times have you needed to prompt someone to wear their safety glasses? You know, wearing a vest and an MVA. And when we enter the homes and neighbourhoods that are less than ideal, we must teach our novices about potential risks. Did you notice the knife on the table? The uncapped needle on the floor where you're about to kneel? You will not likely notice these things, but the novice may not. You are their protector until they learn about these hazards in the real world. Teach them about creating a safe egress by moving obstacles as you enter a house, moving those pot plants to the side as you enter, moving shoes from the stairs, putting the dog away. I know these things seem everyday and simple, but they contribute to our safety. There are so many examples of potential hazards that no university or AEC course will have properly been able to teach where all the dangers can come from. So as you identify risks, share these with your novice and incorporate risk assessment into the reflective process. And I think the service has focused a lot on emotional safety and well-being lately, as it should, so I won't go through it in depth here. But as preceptor, you experience the jobs that your novice experiences. You can spend 12 plus hours a day with this person and get them to know them very well. You are perfectly placed to recognise subtle behavioural changes that may highlight a need for support services to be activated. But most importantly, you create the environment for support. By building a trusting relationship with your preceptee early, you create an environment where they feel supported, they feel safe to open up about their emotions and learn that it is okay to sometimes be not okay. And finally, in any learning environment, a learner needs to feel confident. They can push the boundaries of what they know. They need to feel safe that they can have a go. However, it's not uncommon for learners to feel like a failure at times, that they're not advancing as well as their peers. And when they falter, you need to ensure that you protect their confidence and self-esteem. Keep them grounded and their development goals realistic. Progress is different for everyone, and that's okay. Feeling confident, optimistic, and dare I say normal, lifts up a learner and supports their development. Poor self-esteem and confidence only hinders it. So as a preceptor, take time to highlight the novice's strengths. Don't focus solely on the knowledge gaps. Celebrate the knowledge gained and a job well done. The paramedic preceptor as protector is a key dimension which I think gets overlooked at times, but is no less important than the teaching, teaching aspects of the role. We work largely independently without direct supervision, and this is one of the great aspects of being a paramedic. However, this also creates many risks, and looking out for each other and our patients is essential to good paramedicine. So to sum up, being a paramedic preceptor can be hard work, but you are playing a crucial role in the formative education of the next generation of paramedics. You are a vitally important link in this chain of development. Don't underestimate your importance. We were all there once. Draw on the good qualities of you, you remember of your preceptors and choose not to reflect the bad. And yes, the preceptor is an individual but we work as part of a team. Recognise this can be a difficult role and don't be afraid to ask for help from your DOMs, CTOs and your peers. They'll be often be a valuable source of advice and support to you. As someone with a passion for preceptorship and clinical education, I thank you for what you do as preceptors every day out on the road. And thank you for your uh, time this afternoon.